Now, Framework has pioneered the first 180 watt USB-C charger, and while that's commendable, the charger just doesn't seem to be up to the task of powering the laptop under full load. I know opinions will vary on this, but to me, that's a fail. Was I wrong? Can a 180 watt charger keep up with the demands of the Framework 16 laptop? After a week of rigorous testing, I've uncovered some surprising results. Let's dive in and just see how this little charger stands up to the task. Hey guys, CJ with Elevated Systems, and today we're diving deeper into the Framework 16 laptop. We're tackling power demand and battery life, a hot topic if you've been following my series. You might recall me pointing out a potential pitfall. The 180 watt charger that comes with the laptop might not be up to snuff. Even when plugged in, power hungry tasks like gaming can see the battery level dip by 30% per hour. Framework admits that intense workload on a high performance settings may dip into the battery reserves, but when they say it's only a slight drain, I have to raise an eyebrow, especially since their proposed fix, a 240 watt USB PD charger, isn't even on the market yet. Let's start by crunching some numbers. The Ryzen CPU can hit a high of about 55 watts and generally hovers around 45 watts under sustained load. The GPU can peak at roughly 115 watts, then steadies at 100 watts during continuous use. That totals up to 170 watts, barely leaving a whisper of power for the motherboard, SSD, memory, Wi-Fi display, and so on. It's tight, but we're mostly concerned with sustained power use, and there we have about 35 watts to play with, which sounds feasible, right? But here's the thing, there's a lot of power loss that goes unnoticed. Let me give you a quick low-tech rundown. The charger's job is to transform the AC power from your wall outlet, either 110 or 240 volts, into 36 volts of DC power at five amps, which equals 180 watts yet no component inside the laptop operates on 36 volts. They all require different voltages, which means that power has to be stepped down again within the laptop. And this DC to DC conversion isn't perfectly efficient. Some power gets lost as heat. Every chip inside this laptop, whether it's a resistor, capacitor, transistor, whatever, if it's getting hot, it's losing power. So out of that 180 watts entering a laptop, we're likely getting only about 160 watts actually making it past the first series of conversions out of the main bus and reaching the components that need it, where it's again converted, introducing further loss. By the numbers alone, it seems the 180 watt charger might not be up to par. And if you're like me, someone who squeezes every bit of juice from their PC and can't stand the thought of leaving any performance on the table, then yes, the 180 watt charger falls short. Let's look at the figures and feel free to pause here to study the full test parameters. During a one hour long loop of the Time Spy graphics test number two, the battery had to pitch in an extra 20 to 24 watts, leading to a 30% battery drop. These results were consistent in real world gaming. The same happened during a half hour romp in Cyberpunk 2077, 15% battery gone on both Windows 11 and Linux, even while plugged in. For those who chase peak frame rates or push their system to the limit in demanding tasks, this could be a serious flaw and a deal breaker. But let me try to win your hearts and minds to the balanced power profile. Yeah. I know, I hear your groans. Why even consider dialing down power settings when you're tethered to a power outlet, right? But since 240 watt chargers are still a figment of our collective tech desires, indulge me for a moment. Running that same time spy loop on the balance setting, the battery's contribution was a mere four to seven watts, only dipping to a 95% charge before it began recharging at a rate of two to four watts. Essentially, the battery decreased 5% in the first 45 minutes and then climbed back to about 96.6 in the final quarter hour. This sparked an idea. I set the max charge to 90%, restarted the test, and lo and behold, the battery maintained that 90% capacity for the full hour, alternating between a minor seven watt discharge and charging cycle. 
That's reassuring. We can game or work continuously without the panic of draining battery or a sudden shutdown. But if we're getting up to 24 watts less, there must be a notable performance dip, right? Let's find out. Running some synthetic benchmarks in both the best performance and balance power profiles, our 12% dip in peak power resulted in between a 5 to 6% dip in performance. Looking at real world gaming performance, and the tail was about the same, with performance dropping between 4 and 7% on the balance power profile, which you can see is really just the difference of a handful of frames. Not convinced yet? No worries. I've got more insights up my sleeve. When we talk about reducing power draw, we're also talking about less heat and the numbers are striking. Take a look at the charts. The dark blue and orange line chart the CPU temperature, showing us a substantial 10 degree drop in average temps when using the balanced power profile. The GPU represented by the lighter lines isn't far behind with a seven degree average decrease. The Framework 16 doesn't drop heat, avoiding the pitfalls of thermal saturation. If we lay a trend line over this data, you'll notice the median temperature creeps up just one degree over the entire hour long test. And when the laptop stays cooler, the fans can take a breather. In performance mode, the fans are almost always at full throttle, 100% the entire time. Switch to balanced and the fans hit a peak RPM of just 37% once they level out meaning noise drops significantly. Quieter and cooler, the balance profile makes a compelling case for itself. Because initially, even with the slight performance difference, I was holding on to my stance firmly. I believe that if I'm going to invest in a high end computer, I should be able to tap into its full potential indefinitely, especially when it's tethered to an outlet. However, after doing the work, collecting and analyzing the data, my perspective took a turn. Based on the notably improved thermal and noise performance, I've decided this laptop will remain on balance setting even when a 240 watt USB PD charger hits the shelves. There are of course some nuances to this choice I'll touch on in a bit. But before I get into that, let's explore other avenues for reducing power consumption beyond just tweaking the power plant. Unfortunately, Ryzen Master isn't an option on this system, so curve optimization is out, and with the possibility of voiding warranties with third-party solutions, I won't be covering that. But the GPU as the most power-hungry component in the system presents a great opportunity for savings. Delving into the AMD driver software reveals a plethora of settings that can significantly affect power usage. The default profile allows for granular control. You can tailor settings for each type of task. There's an eco preset, which cuts out all the bells and whistles and caps frame rates to save energy. After running a series of tests with various settings, I'll upload the raw data to my Patreon for anyone who wants to dig into it. But for the sake of time, what I found is that while you can affect the power demand in other ways, peering the HyperRX profile with the balanced power plan offers the most efficient balance between power and performance. The HyperRX profile activates performance boosting features that complement the entry level RX 7700S like super resolution, sharpening, and frame gener, what AMD refers to as fluid motion frames. While frame generation technology to me is in its early stages with some noticeable hiccups like distortions and micro stutters in games like Horizon Zero Dawn and Shadow of the Tomb Raider and more demanding titles like Cyberpunk 2077 and Helldivers 2, it shines effectively doubling frame rates that the RX 7700S could not normally handle with no evidence of distortion or stutters. It may not be necessary for competitive games as the RX 7700S already performs well in games like Apex Legends and especially CS2 after the latest updates, but my tests show it doesn't significantly increase power consumption, so I'll take advantage of it where it works. Now, let's not forget that this 
is a laptop meant for life on the move. While we've been talking a lot about power efficiency when it's plugged in, battery life while it's unplugged is arguably the real game changer. I put this laptop through its paces in various scenarios to see just how long it can last off the cord. As you might remember from my gaming performance deep dive, gaming on battery power isn't gonna get you very far. In fact, I barely squeezed out an hour of AAA gaming on the 85 watt hour battery. Any heavy lifting by the discrete GPU will have you washing that battery percentage plummet. For a broader perspective, I ran the Underwriters Laboratory Procyon Battery Life Test, which simulates a continuous real world workload using the Microsoft Office Suite. With the discrete GPU just handling the display, the battery emptied in about four hours. Gaming with the integrated GPU with the standard bay installed wasn't much better. Even a light game like Dave the Diver consumed around 55 watts, giving you roughly 90 minutes before reaching for that charger. But hold on, it's not all doom and gloom. With the discrete GPU installed, but inactive, the same Procyon test gave us a marathon run of eight hours and 35 minutes, and that's on par with the laptop's performance using the standard expansion bay module, indicating that the discrete GPU doesn't sap battery life when it's not in use, and this is a relief since swapping between the two isn't as straightforward as I initially assumed from Framework's promotional materials. Still, battery longevity is heavily dependent on how you use your laptop. An eight and a half hour best case scenario is quite impressive, outlasting mainstream 16 inches like the Razer Blade 16 or Lenovo Legion 7, which do pack more high-end hardware. When we're talking about similarly priced Windows laptops, the Framework 16 leads the pack in battery life due to its less demanding hardware, and its battery life is below average among peers with comparable specs. And for the Linux enthusiasts out there, stay tuned. I'm dedicating a whole video to Linux testing on this device, which will include power efficiency insights. I've selected four distros for this deep dive, so make sure you're subscribed to catch that video. But to close this one out, we've dissected the Framework 16's power profile and discovered that more power doesn't always mean better performance. The balanced power profile isn't just a compromise, it's a smart strategy for longevity and efficiency. Our test showed that the laptop can keep its cool and stay quiet without sacrificing too much oomph even in gaming. And when it comes to battery life, this laptop stands out delivering the endurance to get through the day away from the outlet. And while I do still think my initial thoughts are valid and a high-end or high-priced laptop should come with a power adapter capable of delivering the full demand of the laptop, it's no longer what I'd call a deal breaker. In the end, the Framework 16 has reshaped how I view power demands in high performance laptops. It's not just about hitting the maximum, it's about hitting the sweet spot. And if this video hit your sweet spot, smack that like button, subscribe, and join me for the next tech deep dive. Until then, stay elevated, and I'll see you in the next one.